Uh, I never thought I'd say this, but shouldn't we be learning something? Say the light! Nobody gave you power. Real power is something you take! Pam is conducting a photo shoot, but she's noticeably down about her mother. Her assistant, Jackie, notices that Alex Ward, the publisher of Dallas Life magazine, is stalking her. Alex introduces himself and immediately hits on Pam. Okay, first of all, she's married. Second of all, she's at work. Third, it's highly unethical to offer coverage for access. I mean, I'm sure that Dallas Life magazine is probably nothing more than a local rag, but Alex is all but promising a glowing story of Pam lets him hang around. Not off to a good start, Alex. In an understated debut, we get the first appearance of William Smithers' Jeremy Wendell of Westar Oil, a large-scale oil company intent on world domination. He offers Bobby a sweetheart deal for Ewing Refined Oil, but Bobby tells him the spit-and-handshake deal that they have with Brady York is more important than money. Wendell tells him that running a business on honesty and friendship is a good way to lose a business. That Wendell is going to be trouble someday. Luella fills JR in on what Bobby's been up to, including Jeremy Wendell and the Jordan Lee deal. Connie interrupts the intel meeting and immediately knows what's up. I like the little detail of Connie being loyal to Bobby and Luella being loyal to JR. That's gonna be an awkward office environment. Bobby pulls up at the shoot to tell Pam he can't take her out to lunch, and then he makes this face. Alex swoops in to pick over the bones by asking Pam to lunch in Bobby's stead. At business lunch, Punk, along with JR, finally gets Chalk to go all in on the Takapa Resort project. Of all people, Neophyte Ray Krebs says that they'll probably have some trouble with the environmentalists. Well, that's an understatement. To make the investment though, Jock is going to have to pull money out of the Ewing oil accounts. Of course, JR knows this when Bobby comes home and tells him about the cartel deal, but somehow it slips JR's mind to tell him. Sue Ellen catches Bobby on his way upstairs and reminds him that JR is never out of the game. She also reminds him of his place in the pecking order. He controls and manipulates the best. And me? You are JR's little brother. I love that Sue Ellen's vitriol comes from Bobby failing to follow through on his promise to save her from JR. So when she throws in with JR at the beginning of the season, and she's well aware of how JR operates, she uses that information to skewer Bobby. And you know what? It works. It's probably the reason Bobby chases power for so long. Pam finally catches Bobby long enough to tell him she's found her mother, still alive, and her mother doesn't want anything to do with her or Cliff. Pam accuses him of only caring about Ewing Oil at the expense of their marriage, which is a role reversal from last season when Pam's job at the store was getting in the way. Bobby storms out to go sleep on the couch at their luxury condo. We don't have time for that though, because it's time for the third annual Lucy Ewing engagement announcement with your hosts, Hal Linden and Polly Holiday. Lucy tells everyone that she and Mitch are getting married. This sets off a firestorm of Ewing anger and one of the great caddy lines from Larry Hackman. Marriage is not always a bed of roses. Isn't that right, Pam? Flames. Flames. On the side of my face. Breathing. Breath. Heaving breaths. Sassy mean JR is the best JR. Mitch says money won't matter because they love each other. Lucy will just have to adjust her lifestyle to accommodate his meager salary. <laughs> Jock vents to Ray about Lucy rushing into marriage, but Ray says she'll be fine. It's interesting, in retrospect, how the writers made sure to give Ray plenty of scenes where he's Lucy's advocate and confidant where her love life is concerned. It's like they're gaslighting the audience into believing he's always just kind of been her mentor. Ray makes the mistake of telling Jock he should at least tell Bobby that he's going to take the money out of the Ewan Goyle coffers. But Jock tells him to mind his own business. Another great drop-in line here makes it clear that the Takapa deal is more than just about making money. Well, things just don't seem like he used to, that's all. It's about Jock not feeling like he's been put out to pasture. And that's why he refuses to tell Bobby, even though it's just common sense. Bobby shows up at the store with apology flowers and asks if they could have dinner to talk things over. Dinner tonight? Thus making this the second time in the episode Bobby's written a check he can't cash. Miss Ellie asks Lucy to reconsider getting married, especially since the pressure of taking care of a wife might be too much for Mitch with his grad student duties. She's got a point. 
especially in the way that she's gently trying to say that Lucy is a little bit high maintenance. Lucy thanks her for her opinion, but shrugs it off. JR has to stifle a cackle because Jock just drained Ewing money to pay for Takapa. Neither he nor Bobby are aware of each other's dealings. Alex Ward stops in to discuss the proofs from the magazine and take both Pam and Liz to lunch. I guess this is a full-service magazine when you look like Pam. Bobby meets with Les Crowley from the bank and discovers that they only have $5 million on hand. Les stirs things up by letting him know that Jock and the boys were headed to the Cattlemen's Club. Bobby storms in to break up the lunch and tell off Jock for making him look like a fool with the cartel. That's when we get one of the all-time greatest exchanges in the show's history, as Jock tells Bobby to back off because all of Ewing Oil belongs to him and he'll take whatever money he wants out of the coffers. And it just builds and builds until we get Nobody gives you power. Real power is something you take. This is just fantastic because the underlying subtext is two men trying to prove to each other and to themselves that they have what it takes to swim with the sharks in the business world. In Bobby's case, that he can be successful and still be ethical. And for Jock, to prove that he's still a strong and virile man who won't just shuffle off into the sunset and die. Both men need their respective deals. Not just for the money, but for the pride. Bobby's, I'll remember that, is also really important because you'd think this would mean Bobby would accept that he has to be ruthless, but instead, it seems this is the point where he realizes that it doesn't matter how successful he makes Ewing Oil by running it ethically. Jock only respects power. The handshake deals are nice, but they're always done from a position of strength. It's always the other guy who comes in hat in hand, reminding them of their promises. At lunch, Pam and Alex bond over mutually share their dreams. Pam doesn't think she has what it takes to be a designer, and Alex tells her about studying to be a painter before realizing he sucks and going back to publishing. He uses it as an opportunity to flirt, which Liz turns on him in a cute bit. Bobby sulks about his dad's betrayal and uses Connie as a sounding board for his ideas. I actually love this dynamic between them. It's a great use of Connie, and these episodes are the only time it ever happens. JR later has the same thing with Sly, but Connie doesn't get her due. Bobby decides that in order to make this deal go through, he has to gouge his independent partners. They're gonna have to match Westar's offer. This is about getting back in with the cartel and mending fences, dammit. Um, counterpoint? You have enough money, Bob. Bobby tells Connie to call the accountant and tell him they're gonna be working through the night. It's absolutely imperative to keep his promises after all. And that's why he's gonna be focused on this tonight. What else does a man have if not his word? Oil plan. Dinner tonight? 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 Elsewhere, JR and Sue Ellen are celebrating Bobby's downfall with the gift of jewelry when they run into Cliff Barnes and Donna Colfer who is wearing what can only be described as a cruel prank on the cinematographer. Alex, who I can only assume has his own <coughs> office at the store now, tries to make a dinner date with Pam to follow up on their two very successful lunch dates. Man, and they said Dusty Farlow was forward. Pam turns him down because she already has a date with Bobby, but no sooner is the door closed than Bobby calls to cancel. Pam reconsiders Alex's invitation on the spot. Hello, Liz. Is Alex there? At breakfast, Ellie asks how the meeting with Punk went, and Jock scowls at Bobby as he tells her it went fine. Well, if I had a nickel for every time a serious sober line was delivered by a person comically holding a piece of bacon on this show, I'd have two nickels, but it's weird that it happened twice, you know? After breakfast, Jock confides in Ray that he's losing confidence in Bobby. Bobby challenged him in front of his friends, after all, and that just can't happen. Meanwhile, Brady York confirms that he just can't meet Westar's offer unless he passes the increased cost onto the customer. Connie tells Bobby she'd just take Westar's offer. But Bobby tells her that's JR's way of doing things, and he's not ready to throw in the ascot just yet. Pamela receives a greenhouse worth of flowers and another invitation to dinner. It turns out that Alex has closed down the restaurant so he and Pam can have dinner and dancing together. Oh, and kissing, and an inappropriate invitation for sex. Pam turns him down, for now. And we're out. As much as I hate the artificially inflated Pambies in Trouble holding pattern they've been in for nine episodes, 
The addition of Alex Ward at least raises the stakes. It's the catalyst for something more than just whining. And although I don't get the appeal, no offense to actor Joel Fabiani, he does offer a better foil than the Wish.com Jenna Wade we had last season. Fabiani has already appeared on the channel in the Snake Eyes video, but you might know him better if you're a fan of the Smiths. Honestly though, his love bombing of Pam comes off way too desperate to be appealing. I know Pam and Bobby have hit the skids, but geez man, play it a little cool. We just met him at the beginning of the episode, and they already have two lunches and two dinners. Eh, maybe it's just hungry. Hungry for that Of course the Alex Ward problem is just an outgrowth of Bobby being overwhelmed at work. A problem he doesn't seem to want to share with Pamela. He spends a lot of time in this episode with Connie, and let's face it, you could do a lot worse than Connie Brasher. Even the celebrity portmanteau Bonnie just works better. Not that I'm advocating, they just have great work chemistry. Connie's a good work wife. JR gets a lot of credit for his machinations in this episode, but honestly all he did was hold back a vital piece of information and watch as Rome burned. Jock and Bobby did this to themselves. Naturally the biggest thing to come out of this episode is one of the last great Jim Davis lines of the series. Even his growling, I am Takapa, later in the season, can't really top this. Real power is something you take, is the early Ewing oil thesis distilled into a single prosaism. It's about as close to a defining moment as you'll get with Jock Ewing. It's also the beginning of the end for Bobby, who will become so disillusioned with the Ewing way of doing things, he does something really drastic. He pays attention to his wife. 